Hello. So this year, the Digital Publishing Summit is uh, online. It's free and it's organized in collaboration with Rinmagin, an initiative from the Spanish uh, FGSR and IPDA. Each day for two weeks, you will be able to interact with experts from the publishing industry twice a day. Hello. So twice a day. Um, and uh, once, uh, once at the end of the morning in Europe and late in ASEAN, uh, the other one in the afternoon in Europe and in the morning in the US. We are using an event application called SwapCard, which centralizes uh, all the features of a virtual event. So the agenda, the live video, the chat, the questions you will ask to the speakers, the polls, the documents that uh, are attached to the, to the sessions, and even the networking between uh, attendees and between attendees and speakers. Uh, by the way, I will uh, thank our premium partner, the Mark, for his support for the DPS. All sessions are recorded and are available the day after. So the slides will be attached most of the time with the sessions. Uh, the swap card application will stay open uh, for all attendees uh, for several years. So you will be able to come back to this and, and check the video again. We may, we may even use the application next year. About today's session. So most of uh, you already know Brian O'Leary, the executive director of the uh, US-based book industry uh, study group, BASG. Brian has a strong experience in the publishing industry and has been presenting BASG studies in multiple occasions in Europe for instance, at the Frankfurt and London book fairs, uh, or uh, at the last uh, Read Magine in Madrid last year. Idea Lab and BASG are both involved in the future of EPUB via the W3C and have decided uh, to set up a US Europe dialogue on a topic of uh, interest for both parties, like the move to an X3 the market penetration of W3C audiobooks, uh, the development of digital comics, or the worldwide adoption of the LCP library. Today, Brian uh, will present um, a publication of the BASG, uh, which is a white paper called uh, Fixing the Flux. The link to this paper is attached to this session of SwapCard, so I hope you'll find some time to read it after the session. Please uh, use the live discussion panel of SwapCard to ask written questions to Brian. I will voice them after his presentation. And uh, be aware your interactions are what makes this uh, virtual event useful for everybody. So Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, I very much appreciate that, Laurent. And thank you for having me today. Um, I'm very sorry, actually, that we can't be together. I was looking forward to this event. I, I think this was going to be the first joint venture between um, EDR Lab and Read Imagine. Um, but I'm glad that this technology gives us options uh, to continue to have a conversation around topics like workflow. For today, um, I actually have uh, five different things I want to talk about. Uh, Laurent suggested that we offer a bit about the book industry study group and the current U.S. market, uh, recognizing that not everybody may be familiar with my organization. We'll talk a bit about uh, what led BISG to look at workflow and why it's important. Uh, we'll go into some detail on best practices and challenges in improving workflows that is tied to the paper that Laurent talked about at the outset. And then we'll talk about steps that you can take after this talk. So one thing to start, um, as I said, that Lorraine asked me to talk briefly about BISG. We are a US focused organization that works to try and create a more informed, empowered and efficient book industry in the United States. Uh, we're different from most other organizations in the United States in that regard, because we try to solve problems that affect two or more parts of the supply chain overall. <clears throat> so publishers talking to manufacturers, manufacturers to distributors, et cetera. 
Um, and we have four objectives. Uh, loosely, these are described as information, standards, research, and community, but I'll give you a bit more detail on that. Uh, the information goal is, or objective is to make BISG the information hub for the book industry supply chain in the US market. With respect to standards, and this is an area where we have overlap with organizations like EDR Lab, we try to foster development, refinement, and use of standards, things that would help improve revenue, promote product visibility, reduce expenses, or ensure transparency across the book industry in the US, but also because it's increasingly global around the world. We conduct research on emerging topics, issues, and trends. That's also an area of overlap with the EDR Lab. And we maintain a community that has relevance because it's a diverse membership base. When we saw it, try to solve a problem, it's not just publishers talking to one another, but rather publishers, manufacturers, retailers, distributors, uh, libraries, and other industry service providers all at the table. It's important to note that we serve the entire industry. That's a distinction for us relative to um, other organizations. Our members are all of equal weight. Um, there's not, we're not favoring one over the other and they are all part of uh, a, a robust ecosystem that we use to solve problems. In this regard, we are similar to some other industry organizations. I've mentioned EDR Lab a couple of times with whom we have, as, as Laurent mentioned, signed a cooperation agreement uh, we overlap in areas like information hub, participation in standards efforts, and research on emerging topics. We're also very uh, akin to Book Industry Communication, which is the UK-based supply chain organization, and BookNet Canada. There are differences among the, our organizations, but we communicate regularly, and we try to also uh, share best practices wherever we can. We also work closely with Editor, which is the standards organization that maintains Onyx, Thema, Editex, and others. Uh, on behalf of the industry. I wanted to uh, also talk a little bit about something that Lorenz suggested, which is the current state of publishing in the US market. Um, there are program, uh, programs already scheduled later this week, including talks by Michael Tamlin from Rakuten Kobo uh, and Michael Bush of Thalia. So I'll be brief in talking about the US market. Uh, it's recovering, but in stages. Uh, the, the opening in the U.S. market is uh, state by state, so area by area. Um, through mid-May, trade sales are down about 1% versus the prior year, but that's been up and down in a lot of different weeks. Um, as many as 800 or more titles that were supposed to come out in the spring have shifted publishing dates, and some have been pushed back to 2021. Uh, bookstores, which had been largely closed, um, uh, have been reopening regionally following the quarantines, but there are still areas, uh, I'm in the uh, north, northeast part of the United States where bookstores are still closed. Amazon itself, which had suspended shipment of non-essential products, which included books, has returned to shipping many of those and books are, are now available on a much more timely basis. Uh, outside of trade, education publishers are not sure what the fall will bring. Uh, there's, there's in higher education, there's questions about whether or not universities will open uh, K-12 uh, or elementary and secondary. Uh, there are also similar questions about how instruction will be delivered. Uh, so that's changed very much what education publishers look at. And as is the case in many parts of the world, most in-person events, including our book expo, have been postponed or canceled. Um, our work overall is driven by committee efforts. Um, in particular, we have five standing committees uh, so starting at the top uh, supply chain, which works on capacity issues. Uh, our, by, our subject codes committee, which updates BISAC, the North American parallel to Thema. We have a rights committee that's working on taxonomies and blockchain, a metadata and identification committee that's looking at marketing applications for book metadata and our workflow committee, which is looking at cross industry workflows for book publishing. That committee was launched in 2019. It, uh, it actually has uh, um, a history, a long history with BISG uh, in that it's a successor to the content structure committee. Uh, content structure was committee was created in the early 2010s and focused on EPUB and accessibility. But there are many organizations that are doing that at this point. Uh, IDPF existed before it. 
but the W3C has some as a role. E, uh, EDR Lab does and has an interest in trying to promote um, both of these topics as well as some others. And there are organizations in the United States like uh, Daisy, uh, Benetech, and uh, an element a part of uh, Georgia Tech that are all working on EPUB and accessibility in various ways. Our view was starting about two years ago that workflow as a topic is, is the underlying driver for EPUB accessibility and other topics. And we felt we could uh, serve the industry better by focusing on workflow and not spending as much time on EPUB and accessibility, except as an output of workflow. So we had three goals or three, three uh, steps that we wanted to take. The first was to try and define workflow and show how it can be improved. And that's the white paper that was published last fall and is now available without charge on the BISG site. That white paper uh, is the core of what we'll talk about today, but we have a next step, uh, which is to develop a grid and glossary that summarizes workflow tools and resources. And we expect to be able to show that in a couple of weeks through a webinar at BISG. I'd actually hope to have it available today, but we're a little bit slower uh, in our committee work relative to uh, as a function of the pandemic. But our ultimate goal is to try and define best practices for future workflows and why why those fu future workflows are important. It's something that is not as clear in the current work because we're talking about an analysis of workflow and also defining some terms that's a necessary first step. But we do think in the next year or two, we're gonna have a lot more to say about uh, best practices for creating both a digital first workflow and multiple in a single workflow to create multiple products, uh, which would be a better practice than we have right now. So going into a, a, a little bit of the detail that comes that's evident in the white paper, we define workflow as the combined impact of three different things. The first is process, which are the steps that we take to get something done. The second is tools, or sometimes people call technologies. These are what we use to accomplish something. And the third is structure and people. Uh, who does the work? What roles do they have? How is the work organized and divided? And the thing that's important to emphasize, although this diagram shows them as three equal size, they're seldom of equal size or weight. Uh, different processes have different emphases. Some are very process driven. Uh, other times it's very technology driven. But it's important to recognize that all three components are a consideration doing workflow. Uh, these, thing, uh, these things combine to create uh, an overall workflow, but the, the, it still begs the question, why is, a, why is workflow as a topic important? Uh, I think there are three reasons. Um, if you consider the central piece, the process tools and structure uh, as the definition of workflow, it determines how we operate. Um, and the second component of it is how we operate, how we work ultimately in a digital environment is how we compete. And I think the third piece is that however we design workflow, it either enables or potentially limits, and I think in many cases today does limit our competitiveness uh, and our ability to turn products around quickly. There are also, uh, our research has shown uh, a set of macro problems that are rooted in workflow issues. Um, some examples. And very often smaller teams or sometimes departments within companies invent workflows that serve their own needs. That complicates things downstream, particularly when they don't follow standards or best practices. The second piece is that organizations and then ultimately supply chains are strained by fractured ineffective workflows. I think one of the things that the uh, pandemic has very much shown, and we'll, we'll give you some data in a moment, uh, is that the supply chain, which is taken for granted in many cases by those who are um, using it, has really been strained by the pandemic and some of its weaknesses have been exposed. This is something that we've, we hope to both, we have worked on and will continue to do so uh, going forward. The third piece is that bad workflows themselves are expensive. They miss opportunities. Sometimes you lose revenue and you certainly uh, increase costs. Uh, if you think about the early days of uh, EPUB, ebook generation, digital book generation, which was largely outsourced in a parallel process, um, most people struggled with it because it was, they would finish a print book and then begin a digital book. Uh, today, many, many organizations are doing these in parallel. And we think that there's a, even a further opportunity to, to do them in tandem and, and use one workflow to drive multiple outputs. 
And the last piece, again, also evident during the pandemic is that legacy print driven workflows don't scale. They can't really support digital or platform agnostic models. And as we're looking at things like components or, or different methods for discovery or the ability to provide accessible content, uh, these print driven workflows are really becoming problematic. Now, I mentioned uh, that we have a little bit of data on the impact of the uh, pandemic. We did a survey, BISG did a survey in, in April, uh, uh, so about two months ago, in which 74% of the respondents were already working remotely. This was in the first month of the, the impact in the United States market. 64%, um, so really two thirds said that in-person workflows will need to be rethought. That was actually the top response of all of those responding to the survey. We had about 250 individual responses. Uh, and the number of comments about workflow uh, was enormous. Uh, people were asking questions like, how do I safely handle arriving shipments? My whole life as an editor feels like it needs to change. Um, web orders are up, but I can't get enough staff to process them. Uh, they're, they're limited to not doing any in-person sales calls. And they had open questions about back office support. So these are not just editorial workflows, although the, the, uh, the, comment, the second comment is, is in that category, but entire supply chain workflows that need to be reconsidered. Um, and respondents were looking for uh, ways to solve immediate workflow problems, uh, bookstores being closed, uh, on-demand production that had slowed or even halted, uh, and the delivery of books that had been produced that way reaching book buyers directly, options to avail available for processing materials, timely notification of delayed and canceled publication dates. A lot of what the industry has done is create lists, but certainly metadata could be better used to help communicate that. But some of the problems with metadata are its, are its own timeliness. Transparent supply chain management, and then questions about resources, workflow changes and updates, and then getting updates from vendors and manufacturers. All of these are on the table they were, uh, and they're all workflow problems that, that were mentioned by people responding to the survey we had in the first month of the pandemic. So not so much in response to the pandemic because we did it last fall uh, and did much of the work in the six months prior. We decided that we would try and do something to help the industry analyze workflows and create a better sense of what was working and was not. Uh, we wrote it for several reasons. Uh, the Fixing the Flux is the name of the paper. Uh, the first of the uh, reasons is that publishing is learned largely on the job. Uh, it's not the kind of thing where uh, there's, there's a, a set path for learning the core components of how book publishing works. There are, unfortunately, few clearly defined best practices, and, and the efforts for creating those best practices are fairly cumbersome. Uh, as an organization, we published several documents in particular for uh, best practices around metadata for providers and recipients and the degree to which they're followed uh, is, is problematic. It, it, we would like it to be more wide, widely used. Um, there is no user's manual for book publishing. And this means that things like consolidations uh, and acquisitions can be painful because each imprint or each company has its own set of practices. Um, we think that there's an opportunity to improve the quality, enhance the analytics, and increase efficiencies uh, for the, the U.S. market. Um, and many of the problems that we're trying to solve as an industry and, and, and as BISG are really symptoms of bad, bad workflows. Um, the other thing we, we tried to uh, emphasize and wanted to document in the paper is that the three pieces of the puzzle, structure, tools, or technologies, and process, are interdependent and they require planning for change, all right? So uh, the first is that, and I mentioned this uh, in showing the first diagram, the relative importance of each component varies by, by use case, by independent workflow, <clears throat> but they're always interdependent. You can't change a process without looking at tools or structure. You can't change structure without looking at the tools and processes that people use to, to get something done. Changing one part without considering the others really uh, very often fails. Um, and even if it doesn't fail, what you'll find is confusion and resistance, if not rejection uh, of any changes that, that uh, somebody wants to make. So we came up with seven best practices, um, steps, if you will, for 
uh, how to improve workflows. Uh, we're going to go through each of these seven in a little bit of detail, but these are fundamentally a, a set of things to uh, get people started, help them dig through some of the underlying problems, and then make sure that they built something that, that will continue to um, help them improve as they go on. So we'll start with the first, which is making workflows visible. Um, there's a real importance in drawing pictures of what's actually happening. Um, you can set boundaries. It can be the start of the end date of a particular process, intervals, activities or deliverables. If you're in a department, it could be when you hand off uh, work from what your department to another, but if it also could be between companies. So uh, you get to a point where you've created a PDFX that's ready to be printed um, by a printer, whether on demand or uh, in a more conventional make for inventory setting. And you can call that the end of it. But the reason that it's important to draw the pictures is that um, it's a starting point for people to understand both what you do and for you to understand what they do. Um, things like in interviews and internal documentation that might already exist can help, but it's, it's, it's important to commit it to paper. The second piece is to share that information, um, whether it's internally to improve cross-functional understanding. So if you have a, um, an editorial department handing something off to production in a book setting, um, you want both sides to understand what both what the handoff looks like and why uh, it exists the way it does. But you can also use it to improve communication across companies uh, and, uh, and, and cross-segment efficiency. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but uh, this has been an area where EDR Lab has been uh, particularly effective in its programming. Uh, I think it's three years ago that the hosting a, a discussion about uh, communication of print instruction, uh, both for uh, conventional and on-demand uh, printing and the importance of getting to true implementation of standards. It's an area where we're both interested and uh, continuing to struggle. Um, an example of something that we think we've done pretty well, we did research in 2012 into metadata handoffs and the disconnects, meaning the misunderstandings or the failure to have a full understanding between providers, uh, typically publishers and metadata recipients. And that miscommunication creates rework. It also sometimes leads to uh, situations where the, um, the, the opportunity to market a book, as an example, is lost because uh, you know, certain information about it uh, is not correct. The third step, and it seems it seems simple, but it's it's often forgotten, is for the the parties involved in this uh, this particular exercise to talk. The maps are a means; they're not an end, uh, meaning that uh, you want to have conversations that help you improve your understanding of each other's processes. Um, that helps you move beyond the two-dimensional maps that I've been talking about in these first two uh, recommendations to understand what is actually happening. The visuals are a prompt for true dialogue, and it's an opportunity to create and build relationships. And those relationships are critical later in the process. Um, it's also important to ask uh, where you can open-ended questions. By this, we mean uh, an it's an opportunity to test your understanding, uh, to ask what we call the five whys, um, the, uh, essentially to better understand, uh, in each case, why somebody does what they do, uh, to, and to get at not just the evidence of it, the, the actual current practices, but rather the impact of um, uh, those decisions on their ultimate handoffs, as well as uh, what happens downstream in the process. Those cause and effect components of an issue are critically important. It helps you determine root causes for either uh, adherence or non-adherence to standards. And it also is an, is an opportunity to build a partnership, a real sense of engagement. That's when you're crossing departments or you're crossing company boundaries, uh, it's, it's uh, easy to misunderstand and it's important not to assign any sort of blame. There's also an opportunity to explore options as broadly as possible. This came out in, in the course of developing our, our white paper, came out as a comment from somebody who serves as a solutions provider, a vendor in, in the workflow space, that very often people uh, look at too few alternatives, particularly for technology or tools. 
Um, and his recommendation was to examine as wide a set of options as you can. And that's hard, but it's, it's an important opportunity to talk with colleagues, for example, that you may have at other companies, solutions providers um, that may already be more knowledgeable about the, uh, the options than, than you could be. Uh, and to do that research early, not after a decision is made. Don't try to make the solution fit the data, but rather look at, look at the options that you have and then go from there. The last, uh, the second last piece rather is to promote meaningful use of standards. Um, we refer this, refer this somewhat uh, re repetitively as standard implementation of standards. Uh, there is always, always we found an argument for customization but you have to recognize that the book industry supply chain is interconnected. What a publisher does affects a manufacturer, affects a distributor, affects a retailer and so on. Um, and each unique need is somebody else's compatibility issue. If you've customized your metadata feed uh, to suit uh, <clears throat> your particular uh, approach to particularly for recipients, um, then you're forcing everybody else upstream and downstream to either adopt that or to create some sort of transition uh, from your, your use of the standard to something else. And the last piece is to regularly re-evaluate anything that you've improved. Uh, you want, there's a, uh, a, a basic um, rubric that we, we outline here. It's not the only one, but it's to define the change problem or opportunity, measure the outcomes, figure out what's happening improve one or more aspects of workflow and create feedback loops, and then measure over time. Uh, don't make it just a, a, a single, a one-time effort to improve a workflow, but rather to regularly look at uh, what you're doing, whether it's having the, the desired output or, or effect, and what you can do to improve beyond that. So those were our seven primary recommendations. We also took in the in the course of doing the white paper uh, a, some time to um, talk about the challenges that might exist in uh, implementing or improving workflows. Um, and one of the things that I think that was really evident uh, was that, uh, particularly for um, bigger efforts that that cut across the supply chain, is that coordinating to address multi-party problems is particularly difficult. Um, the, it's, there are lots of different players involved there the, you have to create a, a common understanding. Um, and it's, it's sometimes quite difficult. The second is that fixing only local problems. So solving a problem that fits a department or maybe a, a publisher or a distributor sub optimizes the whole, it, you, you're only working at the level of the handoff. And so it's important where you can to engage as broadly as possible. Uh, that kind of feeds into that first bullet as well. Um, legacy practices sometimes are embedded. You people have built systems that, that mimic how work is done. If you're trying to change how that work is done, you also have to change the systems. In some cases, there are organizational untouchables. People with a long history are an example, but sometimes also IT systems where um, a significant commitment is been made to integrate, for example, with a, a particular accounting package or, or something similar. Uh, and so IT says, no, you can't change any pieces of that. And that, that makes it harder to change how you work. Shifting the burden is an issue. Uh, in particular, uh, it, in, in the beginning, for example, if you're trying to get better metadata, uh, the work may shift to editors or marketing departments who don't necessarily see the immediate benefit. They're doing more work, but the benefit is six, 12, or, eight, or further, uh, six mo further months down the road. Um, so you need to be able to plan for that and perhaps give them additional resource. Uh, it's messy work and people who are leading it get tired. Uh, and so re regular renewing leadership is important. And the last piece, and, and I, this is embedded in our, our evaluation as well, is the work never ends. We made a set of recommendations. Uh, these are all available in the paper uh, following our best practices. The seven recommendations is important to expect challenges and plan for them, uh, to remember how workflow components are all interdependent, uh, to keep that in mind at all times so that you don't focus on only one aspect of workflow. Uh, it's okay to stay to start small to within a department or a company. Don't stay small because the real benefits are, are solving the tricky problems and handoffs across an industry. 
it's important and in many book publishing uh, companies uh, don't have it. Change management skills, the ability to look uh, at a project over a long period of time and to begin ideally with the end in mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about those ends in the section that follows. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on steps that you can take. Um, these are not uh, limited to just publishers. One is to become better informed. Uh, the, uh, Laurent has been kind enough to provide a link to the BISG workflow white paper. Uh, that's available without charge. The only thing we ask is that you register on the BISG website if you're not already set up. You can register as a non-member uh, that does not cost you anything. And then uh, once we go through a small approval process that takes me you generally just a minute or two, uh, the, uh, you'll be able to download the paper. It's important to talk to industry partners, uh, and this includes organizations like EDR Lab. You know, looking at how your company workflow compares is really good feedback. Uh, generally, organizations like BISG, BIC, Bookna Canada, and EDR Lab uh, have an opportunity to uh, see multiple installations of, and solutions to different problems. And so it's, it's, it's a good conversation to have, but it's also uh, your, all the vendors that you're already working with and anyone that you're considering can also give you a, an, an honest picture of how well you're doing relative to the industry. Colleagues, both inside your company and at competitive firms uh, are also resources. Um, and then there are multiple, if you Google publishing workflows, uh, you'll find an endless array of work of resources. Um, it's probably better to start with partners and vendors uh, before you go there, but uh, it's at least one way to get at that. A second piece, and this is this bears a little bit more conversation, um, is to take advantage of the current disruption. So, you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, well before the pandemic in 2017, EDR Lab hosted a talk by Alexander Markowitz and Michaela Philipson about what they call industry 4.0. It, it, it's probably, it, in our case, it's the need for book publishing to adapt, adopt standards that dramatically reduce errors, rework, and human intervention. Um, and I think now is the time to push forward on those kinds of ideas. Um, I think it's important for everybody and not just publishers to look at revamping workflows to be digital first. Um, fundamentally, to write once, read many, to create one workflow that creates a print product, an on-demand product, a digital product or a set of digital products, uh, and to fundamentally eliminate parallel or and certainly sequential development of digital formats. Um, uh, this is not only, it's both a goal and a means toward improving success for things like born accessible products. Uh, whenever you create something, particularly in sequential method that is not, uh, where you're not thinking about accessibility at the outset, uh, you're, leave, you're leaving uh, functionality on the table and you're probably leaving some money on the table as well. I think too, there's an opportunity to improve supply chain handoffs overall to reduce manual intervention. Um, we need better and ideally seamless support for on-demand products. If you're creating uh, a, one copy of a book, the, the, the way that that happens cannot involve anything similar to what we're currently doing for creating uh, books for inventory. The second is to improve communication between publishers and manufacturers. Uh, XBITS is a standard developed in the United States. Uh, it's not widely used, really one manufacturer at this point. Uh, and only a smattering of their customers. But it's a good standard that essentially captures all of the information that a publisher would reasonably want to communicate to a manufacturer. Some drawn from standards like Onyx, others drawn from production specifications. Um, but it's not widely used. And so a lot of the work that's that in communication that occurs between different parts of the industry requires manual intervention and communication. And the last piece is effective use of features like Onyx 3's acknowledgement messaging. I mean, first we need to get and finish the implementation of Onyx 3, uh, which I think will be substantially improved uh, this year uh, with, uh, with Amazon setting a deadline for provision of Onyx 3 to describe physical products by the end of calendar 2020. But the reality is that there are features built into standards like Editex and Onyx 3 that allow for two-way communication between entities uh, we're not taking widespread advantage of them, and I think we should. Um, just on the workflow resources front, uh, these are uh, 
uh, some of the things that I would point to. Our workflow committee is actually open to any member. I realize in, in, in the case of a European audience that many of you may not be members, but if you're interested in sampling it, particularly during the time of the pandemic, uh, we've actually made a decision to um, allow anyone uh, who's not a member of BISG to do that during the period where um, the industry is trying to respond to COVID-19. Um, we're also going to be following up on the uh, supply chain survey. The results of that were covered in a um, webinar that we did in on April 9th, uh, and it was recorded. If you're interested in that, write to me at info at BISG, and we'll get you a link to it. And BISG itself, we do a lot of different events. We have actually added eight um, different uh, events. Most of them are COVID-19 related for this summer. But we all, some of them are also workflow related and we're already on the calendar and we're looking forward to hosting those conversations. And our current efforts uh, uh, include a tools and resource summary that, uh, that's a, glid, a grid, uh, meaning a, uh, by supply chain step, what are the tools and resources that you typically would use, as well as a glossary that explains uh, what those terms mean in more detail than can be possible in a grid format. Uh, we expect to be able to show that to the world in about two weeks. Um, we're working on documenting and improving prevailing supply chains. Uh, in our supply chain committee, we're looking at inventory driven, on demand and digital book workflows to start. And I expect that after that comes out, we're hoping to be able to finish the work in June and publish it next month. Um, after that work is available, I'm sure it'll prompt questions and observations that will lead us to work in other areas as well. Um, we're trying to identify important or promising workflow projects. Uh, there are a variety of different things that will follow once we get grid and glossary out. Uh, and we're responding to what we heard in the COVID-19 survey about uh, the need for more specific guidance and direction when it comes to uh, the uh, to topics related to workflow. So there's a lot going on in this, this area within BISG. We kind of given you the a snapshot of what we did to focus on the analysis of, um, uh, of workflows in, in publishing writ large, but we know that there's more yet to be done and I'm sure you'll have some questions. And with that, I think we're prepared to, to turn to questions and I'm sure Laurent, you have a, already have a few and, and maybe we can get some more as, as we continue this conversation. Yes, we've got questions. So Good. the first one is uh, about the, the figure you have given before, is there an explanation of the fact that the trade sales went down only 1% in the US? It's, it's not a lot in Europe, it seems to be much bigger. I think, I think there's been a, a push to um, solve some of the problems that, that existed and many of the independent retailers uh, uh, did not open their doors for customers, but they, they turned to uh, shipping to their own communities. Um, Amazon, uh, there was a rebound when Amazon came back and began uh, fulfilling book orders on a more timely basis after, after the, the essential emergencies uh, were addressed. Uh, the sales overall went up um, and uh, year over year. Um, and so people I think have been looking for books, but it's, I think that it's, that 1% is also uh, probably not evenly distributed so if, you, if there are publishers that have been hurt more, more uh, significantly than others, um, and it's uh, and it, it the, the, that too is it's not clear what the uh, impact will be when people start going back to work. So, thank you. Another question: Could you provide examples on how digital workflows help to do product planning? Uh, you mean like a digital first workflow or not not specifically to uh, a, in, a, an EPUB or something like that? I'm not sure. Luis, yeah. uh, it's Luis Gonzalez who asked the questions. It's about uh, digital workflows in, in general, I guess. Sure. Not about digital books. So uh, I think one of the things that, that uh, um, we don't have yet in book publishing is a, um, a digital first workflow. But I do think that they would help in product planning because they would essentially, that, that model of write once, read many, um, in effect is saying, all right, for any given book, any title, we're gonna create um, a certain number of formats, maybe an unlimited number of formats, but 
uh, but certainly we begin with print uh, on demand is not a different format in the sense that the consumer sees, but the process used to create it is different. Um, and the communication around it is different. Digital can have many different uh, implementations and we, you, uh, we can also talk about audiobooks having its own implementation. Um, you wanna be able to create one workflow that drives all of those so that you can then allocate the cost of creating that, um, that product across multiple instances. Um, that is not really the way we work right now. We, we tend to look at um, a, a hard cover and then maybe a, a, a secondary release of soft cover as the primary way that we evaluate costs. I think that ebooks have been um, a common thing now for more than a decade and we need to work, we need to create workflows that generate um, multiple, multiple editions, print and digital uh, without uh, creating either sequential or parallel workflow. Speaking about this uh, digital first workflows, in the US, uh, do you see a certain uh, proper percentage of publishers having managed to set up such a digital first workflow, or is it really in its infancy for, 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 for now? Well, you know, book publishing is, is, is there are really five publishing workflows. Uh, so if you look at professional, scholarly, academic, um, and, and to a certain extent, education workflows, uh, they're more likely to be uh, either XML first or born accessible. I mean, they've, they've had both in the US market regulatory as well as commercial uh, constraints. People are, are looking and, and in a number of platforms have arisen, uh, for example, vital source, um, uh, you know, to provide digital content to uh, an education audience. So they're doing reasonably well. But if you're looking at trade, which is about half of the sales in the US market, if not a little bit more, um, then no, there has not been a lot of progress in that within it. I think digital books are still being treated as a secondary workflow or parallel workflow. Um, and I think accessibility with very few exceptions in, in the trade space is an afterthought. Um, you know, and I think it was, it kind of has its legacy in things like large print. So we would see, a, see what books were successful and then take a subsection of those that were the most successful and make them large print editions because you could imagine there was demand. The reality is demand for, for accessible content exists throughout the, the entire ecosystem and we're not meeting it. Thank you. Another question, uh, can mapping and in general, documenting the workflows be useful for getting on board new recruits with no prior knowledge of the organization. Uh, so uh, the, the, the attendee says that, okay, you have described uh, how helpful it is to uh, map workflows to optimize them, but isn't it also a discovery mechanism for new commerce? I totally agree. I mean, one of the things that I, I said just quickly in passing is that there's no instruction manual for book publishing, um, whether it's publishing publishers or other parts of the industry. And, and so as a result, not having a standard way to point and say, here's where you are, here's what happens before, here's what happens after your, your role is critically, uh, that's critically important, but we don't have it right now. It would be really great to have that. Um, I just speaking on a personal level, um, we're, we're hiring a, um, a, a new person to start in the operations role. We'll, he'll, he'll begin on in mid June and, you know, just pulling together the work plans that we have right now and, and showing how our systems work is, uh, uh, it's not a full-time job for me, but it probably could be. And that's an example of an opportunity lost on our side. I think that it would be very helpful to have that documented and regularly updated so that we all saw where we were and how we were doing. And another question from uh, Michaelis uh, Calamaras also, could external agents of change be included in this workflow improvement model, probably both as a challenge and an opportunity? I have in mind the case of publishers working with tech and consultant companies. Yeah, I think that there are two, two aspects of that. First is, I mean, whether it's a technology company or a consultant or somebody who's a third party, uh, in, an independent voice, the, and particularly one that can look at a problem from a, 
an angle or a perspective that did not previously exist is is an important um, I refer to it in the vernacular as a can opener, you know, an opportunity to open a discussion and create a conversation that didn't exist before. And that's important because uh, if, you're, if you've been doing this, the same thing for a while, it's hard to explain um, why you do it. And having somebody who can show you other alternatives is important. But, and the but is important, uh, if you work in book publishing, you know that it's very hard to get people to look at uh, technology and other uh, non-book uh, examples uh, as seriously as they might. There's always a reason to dismiss it. I don't think those reasons are necessarily good or accurate, but simply introducing um, a different voice uh, is not enough. You have to get people to come to the table and truly you know, listen and engage uh, and understand both similarities and differences. The, the, I, I have an example that goes back for me almost uh, oh, more than 35 years. Somebody's uh, teacher in business school said that it's always harder to uh, see, it's harder to see similarities than it is to see differences. So when somebody comes to the table and gives you an idea, you can tell all the reasons why it's not um, relevant to book publishing. The thing that's hard to do and the thing I encourage anyone who brings somebody new to the table, talk about the similarities. What is it was, what is this particular example? How is it like what we do and how can we take advantage of it? Great. And uh, maybe the last questions about uh, audiobooks. Uh, what are the main work workflow issues publishers are facing with the creation of audiobooks? Is there a workflow today known for audiobooks in fact? Well, you know that uh, you, this is work that you, Laurent, you've been involved with. Uh, the W3C is um, uh, promoting a standard right now that I hope will get people to be thinking about um, uh, both a reference in implementation and a uh, um, workflow in general. I, I'm afraid that audiobooks right now, at least in the US market, there, there may be good examples that I'm not familiar with outside of it. But I think that audiobooks right now are still being handled the way that ebooks were, particularly in, in the 2008 to 2011, as a separate uh, parallel workflow uh, outsourced to somebody else. Um, there are a few publishers that are creating workflow audiobook content in in house, but I don't think that is necessarily a better work. It, it's a good workflow for those publishers, but I don't know that it generates an audiobook that is uh, compliant with the standards. The two things I would love to see for audiobooks and for e, e digital books are greater use of standards um, and uh, better understanding of how to create um, the, the relevant information, metadata in particular, um, to go to, to accompany them in, in an integrated way. Because you should be talking about an audiobook, a digital book, and a physical book with uh, more or less the same marketing content. And, very often things like that are not the case. So I, I'm afraid the workflows still need work. And um, the good news is that's what we plan to do is you know kind of focus on those opportunities. Um, before the, the meeting, we have set up a small poll with two questions only. One was, uh, did you already formalize or mapped your production workflow? And we had uh, 10 votes. Uh, 50 yes, 50 no. So it's a good news. In fact, some people already uh, try to uh, formalize their workflow. The other question was, would sample workflows released by BASG be useful for you? And there is uh, also uh, eight votes and another uh, 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 unanimity vote uh, for yes. Yes. So you've got a job to do and uh, the samples and the tools and all you will be able to provide will be, will be uh, great for the industry, it seems. It is, it is um, you know, we thought about doing sample workflows in the white paper that's already been published and we held back. It was interesting because developing the, 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 maybe the ideal workflow um, uh, generated a lot of, uh, controversy because people thought, well, that's not my ideal workflow. Um, we're currently working in the supply chain committee to try and get at the industry workflow. 
and again, it's people are, they look to see themselves in the workflows. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it sometimes gets in the way of people having a conversation about what's the core step. Um, if I can give an example, if we have time, I, I'd be glad to. Okay, uh, we have time. Okay, well, just, uh, just uh, in, in miniature, the problem that we're wrestling with right now is that um, some people use, some uh, publishers use distributors. Some people, some publishers ship directly to warehouses. Sometimes they do both. Sometimes they use uh, third parties that are not distributors. Um, and so everybody's saying, well, you have to have a, a section that is um, uh, for, for how we manage physical product that reflects my, my specific use of a vendor. Um, and ultimately we tried to figure out what is it that, what's the generalized summary here? And it's whether you make for inventory or you make for order. Um, meaning that if you make for inventory, then maybe you put it in a warehouse, maybe you put it in a box and immediately ship it. There are different ways to handle that, but it's, you're essentially making quantities of books to be held somewhere. Whereas making for order has a totally different rhythm. And um, once people saw that, and we, it wasn't like we knew it at the beginning, um, once people saw that, I said, okay, yeah, that makes more sense for how we think about the supply chain and, and for differences across it. But getting to that understanding is a conversation that took us probably two or three meetings. And you know, now we have an industry to try and bring up to speed. So it's, uh, it's a process and it, it takes work, but we will get there, I think. Great. And well, thank you very much, Brian. It seems that we have gone through all uh, the questions. There is one I wasn't able to translate from Spanish, so, so I'm sorry. We will uh, look at that uh, another time. And uh, when we do get it translated, I'll be glad to answer it. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, glad you were able to make this, uh, this presentation. I hope you... Uh, a great uh, day today and uh, the, the week to come. So thank you for all the attendees. I hope that you will be able to follow the, the next uh, sessions. Uh, tomorrow, two sessions, and uh, you've got sessions during the two next weeks. So, so great agenda. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it as well. And uh, I've already promised Andrew Romberg that I would uh, attend his session.